everyone and welcome back to another insightful episode of the Synapse podcast series. I'm Hitvi Shah, your host. And today we are diving into a crucial topic that affects millions worldwide, which is alcohol-related liver diseases. And to discuss this crucial topic, we are honored to have with us Dr. Pratik Parikh, a distinguished hepatologist and a liver transplant expert. Dr. Parikh is not only the founder and CEO of Repurgo, but also leads the Department of Hepatology at Apollo Hospitals in Ahmedabad. With his extensive experience in hepatology and liver transplantation, Dr. Parikh brings invaluable insights to the complexities of liver diseases and their management. So, welcome Dr. Parikh and we are excited to have you with us. Thank you, Hitri. Nice to be here. So, to begin with, uh, let's begin with basics. Um, could you explain what exactly alcohol-associated liver disease is and how alcohol affects the liver? So, uh, alcohol-associated liver disease is actually a newer terminology. Previously, we used to label it as alcoholic liver disease, but it is a bit stigmatizing. Because when we label somebody as alcoholic, it is stigmatizing. So the new terminology is alcohol-associated liver disease that you rightly mentioned. So we need to understand that whenever alcohol goes into the body, it is uh, being broken down into the liver. And as a part of this breaking down process, one of the substance which is formed is called as an aldehyde. Now this aldehyde is a toxic substance. Uh, the rate limiting step or in the metabolism, uh, the aldehyde accumulates in the liver and starts affecting the liver. So when it starts affecting the liver, it's a stepwise process. In the initial per, uh, portion, of, I would say that 90% of the patient who takes significant amount of alcohol, that is more than 60 grams of alcohol per sitting, they tend to develop fatty liver or which we now know as steatotic liver disease. Over a period of time, because of this constant uh, damage ongoing, there is development of hepatitis or swelling or damage to the hepatocytes, which is uh, seen and visible in various blood investigations as well as clinical symptoms. Over a period of time, the liver tries to heal itself and there is scarring. So this scarring progresses as fibrosis. And once the fibrosis progresses to a certain level, that is more than 60 to 70 percent of the liver, it forms a cirrhosis, which eventually would lead to development of liver cancer. So alcohol over a period of time progresses from steatotic liver disease or fatty liver to hepatitis, to fibrosis, to cirrhosis, and then to liver cancer. That's how the alcohol affects the liver. Yes, thank you for the explanation. And I think it is so crucial to understand the impact of alcohol that it causes to the liver. Now, uh, moving on, could you discuss the most effective strategies for managing uh, patients with alcohol, um, with early stage alcoholic liver diseases, particularly in terms of lifestyle modifications? Yes, so uh, the problem over here is, you know, a lot of people uh, justify their drinking. So those who drink significant amount of alcohol, they would justify by X, Y, Z reasons. And sometimes even the family supports them saying that, no, he's suffering from this, this, he has had a business loss or, and so that justification should go on. There's no justification to alcohol. And all even latest research have shown that alcohol in no matter small or large quantity is detrimental. So the previous belief that small amount of alcohol is useful for certain diseases or false. So no amount of alcohol is good for you. So educating the family members, getting a good social support because they need somebody whom they listen to and then diverting them to a counselor, taking help from uh, professionals like psychiatrist and psychologist is very important. Besides that, you know, a lot of times these people drink so much that they are nutritionally depleted. So they need to be replenished uh, by nutrition. They need to be given good amount of food. A lot of times because of liver, they restrict food. So normally they should be given all high calorie food, even ghee, milk, everything can be given to those people and that should be given. Once we are dealing with those things, the other problem which all these people face is development of withdrawal symptoms in the early part. As soon as they stop alcohol, they develop withdrawal symptoms. 
so we need have uh, we need to start certain medications to prevent this withdrawal and over after two weeks it is the craving so there are medications available which decreases the craving for alcohol and thereby preventing recidivism or relapse to drinking so once we go all to all risk with a good social support good support from the counseling team and maintaining the nutrition and educating the patient themselves about the side effects of alcohol and diverting their energy to some productive way i think that's the early part before the liver disease sets in also detecting these diseases would be also difficult right at an early stage uh, i think it's the family knows so it, it's not about detecting it is family accepting it so family already know that he is drinking too much amount of alcohol so usually they force them to get all the investigations done and then they get them to our clinic unfortunately no one walks directly to our clinic unless forced by a family member or somebody whom they listen to right so now can you explain the differences in alcohol metabolism among individuals and how do these differences impact the development and progression of liver disease let's understand that everybody who drinks alcohol do not develop alcohol related liver disease so what we have uh, seen is 20% of the people who drink significant amount of alcohol develop liver disease so that is all dependent upon their metabolism so we all know that indians can digest less amount of alcohol as compared to caucasians so indians develop a disease at a earlier stage uh, and at a younger age as compared to caucasian population so to understand that we need to understand that alcohol once it enters into the liver it gets degraded to aldehyde or uh, and then which is degraded to acetate and then it is washed off as water and carbon dioxide now aldehyde or acetaldehyde is the toxic agent now the acetaldehyde forms at a speedier rate and then it is broken down at a slower rate so the acetaldehyde accumulates in the liver causing damage to the liver so those who are slow metabolizers of aldehyde would have prolonged exposure to aldehyde and that would cause damage to the liver also it has been seen that if in there is gender differences so males and females females even if they amount take same amount of alcohol they tend to develop a higher amount of liver disease and as the age progresses the tendency to develop liver disease also increases along with uh, the amount of alcohol intake so it's genetics it's age is gender are the major non modifiable risk factors i would say that would affect your drinking uh, and related liver disease yes that was fascinating now um, let's talk about prevention so what preventive measures have proven most effective in reducing the incidence of alcohol related liver diseases both at the individual patient level and in public health initiatives so if we see about our prevention now uh, india is a good example like in uh, if we come to neighboring states of gujarat rajasthan maharashtra you know in uh, rajasthan and maharashtra alcohol is creating by is the uh, policies by the government which prevents routine use of alcohol on day to day life so that is mandatory and then government role is the most crucial like in smoking you know if you go all advertisements in the smoking in the onset of the movies also they show that smoking is injurious to health the same thing applies to alcohol the more message it should be uh, you know percolated into the uh, system by the using the government agencies and they have uh, the capacity to spread this message coming to the individual level i think uh, as i previously also discussed no for an individual who actually starts how it starts is usually they start with peer pressure then they start on a routine on a weekend basis and then they become a daily habituated alcohol use disorder patients so a social support or a social support system where you know there is a lot of social pressure uh, where which prevents them from you know wavering in that direction is important educating the patients are also important maintaining their nutrition maintaining a healthy lifestyle like exercise is very important if if you are exercising well you are maintaining your muscle mass and overall we need to keep on telling them about the uh, amount of alcohol binge drinking rapid drinking empty stomach drinking or uh, having alcohol free days how alcohol free days allows uh, liver to regenerate so we need to educate them as well so from the government perspective i would say that it is the policies and from the individual perspective i would say the family rather than the individual 
they do a play a role in actually dealing with this disorder that is remarkable now i think it is truly said that prevention is key now the liver is yeah. known for its remarkable ability to regenerate we all know that so how does this capacity for regeneration and repair factor into management of alcoholic liver diseases so uh, the only internal organ which can regenerate is liver so skin is at the one of the other organs and liver so liver has a tremendous capacity to regenerate uh, it is believed that you know uh, even if there is a sudden insult to the liver and uh, the liver would regenerate over a period of time so if in a normal person who is not drinking alcohol you know we and they they have some disease of the liver we may be able to take out even 70 to 80% of the liver and the remaining 20% would over over a period of time you know hypertrophy and increase in the size and would maintain the function so even 20% of the liver is good enough but this regenerative capacity is a point of no return i would say so whenever there is a consistent persistent injury uh, to the liver caused by alcohol or any other substance for example viral hepatitis or even fat so this process would uh, regeneration and scarring regeneration and scarring would continue over a period of years and when the scarring overwhelms then the regenerative capacity of the liver fails and that is we call it as point of no return and that we in medical term label it as cirrhosis of liver so that is important uh, besides the risk factor control to maintain a good regenerative capacity they don't need any liver tonics or uh, you know detoxification agent it is just good healthy lifestyle would help regenerate the liver no tonics are useful okay so if your liver is related to alcohol disease and it has gone up to like 70 80 percent it can with lifestyle modification it can regenerate right okay. without any toxins just stopping alcohol and modifying risk factors it would regenerate but till it has caused a uh, point of no return so if there is no cirrhosis it would regenerate now there is some research going on where the cirrhosis reversal is also believed to be a possibility but it is too early to comment on it as of now yes that's incredible aspect as well now uh, let's uh, talk about some treatment strategies so what treatment strategies do you find most effective in promoting alcohol uh, abstinence and uh, preventing relapse in patients with alcoholic liver disease and how do you address the challenges of adherence to these strategies it's a big challenge for everybody yes we gave it all but yet uh, we need to understand a lot of people uh, have a relapse just give you an example uh, those who get transplanted after damaging the liver because of alcohol and they get a new liver so even after that 5% of the patients do damage their liver again by drinking although 95% do not so that's the problem we all are facing at all levels but we need to keep at all levels for an individual level we need to keep on calling him on a regular follow up monitoring his liver test on our uh, you know uh, we say that surprise testing for alcohol levels and all the routine blood test as well as the ultrasound needs to be done as well as checking for the social getting history from the family members make pressurizing the family members calling them for a regular even on a uh, you know more than allowed uh, follow up for psychologist as well as psychiatrist a follow up where there is counseling is being done cognitive behavioral therapy has been done by them so that is mandatory after that there are drugs as i had mentioned so there are prescription drugs which can be given to prevent the relapse and prevent them from you know uh, craving for alcohol and going to that way changing the company changing the environment a lot of people a couple of my patients have actually migrated out of india to a, to another country uh, where there is a better uh, family support and the family members are staying uh so that they themselves can prevent in the fear of family members that's what they have felt and they are now abstinent so i believe that that system also works other than that it is the doctor patient relationship also does matter difference you know when the patient and the doctors are like friends and there's a rapport with the patient a lot of times patients would uh, be honest and say that you know he had a drink and if that rapport is developed over a period of time they would actually be sticking to it uh, considering the respect that you have in front of the patient 
that is insightful and now lastly how do coexisting liver conditions such as uh, non alcoholic uh, liver diseases uh, fatty liver disease or viral hepatitis influence the progression and treatment of alcohol related liver disease damage to the liver so if there is any other risk factor which can cause damage to the liver obviously the disease is going to progress at a much rapid stage and the most common disease worldwide is steatotic liver disease previously known as fatty liver disease where 30 to 50 percent of indians suffer from steatotic liver disease so if they drink alcohol obviously alcohol plus fat both combined together would cause rapid damage to the liver and an early development of cirrhosis or crossing point of no return and they develop more complications because alcohol as well as fat affects other organs like heart and kidneys as well which are trying to cope up for the compensating the damage caused by the alcohol itself to the liver similar is with the viral hepatitis so viral hepatitis it's a, is a cause for liver cirrhosis liver cancer so when viral hepatitis in a patients of viral hepatitis start drinking alcohol they have a rapid progression of liver disease besides on the treatment because a lot of times we are so obsessed with uh, asking the patients to stop alcohol so even if the patient is taking alcohol we tend to screen for other risk factors as well because if we tend to miss those risk factors then the disease continues to progress even if the patient is abstinent from alcohol so if there is steatotic liver disease we need to treat for steatotic liver disease and there are wonderful treatment available without side effect for viral hepatitis which can also be given to these patients simultaneously while we are treating for alcohol associated liver disease yeah but you know a lot of times uh, as as doctors you know as soon as the relatives say that he is drinking too much of alcohol we get so obsessed and biased by labeling them as alcohol associated liver disease we tend to forget screening for other risk factors and that should be mandatory and that is the message that alcohol does not protect them from other disease they can still suffer from other disease yes that's right and thank you for sharing that so before we wrap up one last question from my end would be like um, we all know that younger generation has been drink starting drinking alcohol at a quite uh, younger age than the previous generations so what would be the one message that you would like to give to the younger generations see i'm from gujarat again so in gujarat uh, if you say two decades back the question would be as do you drink and if you say yes even if you are drinking once in uh, you know six months and if you say yes you would not find a, a girl match on an arranged marriage so that was the level it was there now the social acceptance of alcohol has increased uh, family accepts that people do take alcohol uh, that is a because of the you know i would say globalization a lot of internet a lot of westernization now the travel people travel a lot of places and that acceptance has seeped in the detrimental part is we are different from caucasians so if caucasians are taking a bottle of wine a week or two bottles of wine a week their entire metabolism is different and we should not be aping for them so the message to them all the youngsters who would be listening is we are different our genetics is different our weather and climate are different so don't try and copy the western population they have the different entire scenario so stick to our basics stick to our family ancestries where they believe that alcohol is not good for you and stay away from alcohol no amount of alcohol is good for you thank you for that message and um, as we wrap up today's session i would like to thank dr parikh for sharing your insights and it has been incredibly valuable and we look forward for more such discussions doctor thank you thank you thank you him. and to our listeners thank you for tuning in remember If you're a healthcare professional who is eager to delve deeper into medical topics or have questions, do not hesitate to join us on MedSynapse platform. MedSynapse platform is not just a resource; it's a dynamic space where you can connect with your medical peers, participate in meaningful discussions, and contribute to the ongoing evolution of healthcare. So until next time, stay healthy and keep learning.